Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Reka Iyer. I'm NYSIF's Vice President of Scientific and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging Outreach. I thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are here today in honor of Women's History Month to celebrate, to reflect, to learn, to look at the challenges that have historically hindered women in science, the progress that we've made in recent years, and what all of this decades-long fight teaches us about where we go from here to advance equity for all minoritized communities in science. In science. There's still a great deal of work ahead to do that, and I'm confident that with, with people like our panelists today, we'll be uh, in good position to, uh, to take on those challenges. Gender equity and equity writ large has always been a core priority for NYSIF, and that is thanks to the vision and passion <clears throat> of our founding CEO, Susan Solomon, who we tragically lost to ovarian cancer six months ago. Susan was deeply dedicated to NYSIF's mission of accelerating cures for the major diseases of our time. And as a prolific remover of obstacles, she quickly realized that gender disparities in the field were holding us back because as she put it, we cannot move as fast as we need to in this field if all of the brightest minds do not have equal opportunities to succeed. And so for her and therefore for NYSIF, advancing equity in STEM became mission critical. This led Susan to launch NYSIF's initiative on women in science and engineering over a decade ago, followed by many other efforts to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging that we will touch on later. And so in that spirit, I'd like to dedicate uh, today's event to Susan's memory, um, her uh, her legacy and some highlights uh, have just been shared in the chat for those of you who may not be familiar. And, you know, in that spirit as a woman of action, we are going to highlight actions throughout our discussion today that have made a difference in the fight for gender equity and equity writ large. While this is in honor of Women's History Month, our, our discussion will by no means be limited to issues that affect women. Our intention here is to learn from the trajectory of women in science and gender equity in science, how we can best advance equity for all minoritized groups. And we intend to do just that. Acknowledging that the great progress that has been made to advance women in science is certainly lacking for many other groups. To quote the great Ben Barris, a visionary neuroscientist, openly transgender scientist, and a fierce advocate for equity, it is hard enough to advance the frontiers of science without having to simultaneously confront a mountain of prejudice. Every one of us has the responsibility to work to recognize and lessen these barriers, lest the passion for science that drives many of our best and brightest diverse young scientists is, scientists is extinguished, leading them to choose other careers. It is in that spirit that we launched today's discussion. I wanna thank everyone who has submitted questions at registration. I encourage all of you to submit questions through the Q&A function at any time, and uh, we'll do our best to get to all of them as we go. We're incredibly lucky today to have with us in this discussion, Micah Sander, uh, the scientific director of the Max Delbruck Center in Berlin. She is a pioneer in diabetes modeling with stem cells. Her research has earned her numerous awards and she is a passionate vocal advocate for equity in science. Through her international and highly accomplished career spanning several prominent institutions worldwide, she has a unique and richly informed perspective on what it means to be a woman in science, what it means to be a leader in science. So Micah, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited for this conversation. Pleasure to be here. So I wanna start by looking back um, the at the challenges that have really hindered women and ge gender minorities in science. It is challenges that birth advocates. Um, so we'd love to hear from you about your journey as a woman in science. Um, how, you know, there's a question also about how you knew what you wanted to specialize in and what obstacles you encountered that inspired you to become the advocate that you are today. Yeah, happy to do it. I mean, I think for most of us, it sort of starts when we are younger, you know, when we're children or teenagers, we don't think much about, um, you know, what is our role as like a female versus a male, we were just sort of driven by our interests. And I think that's how it actually started for me in the beginning, too. I was just a curious person who, um, you know, felt that that could be exciting to um, discover new knowledge. So for me, pursuing science was initially really driven by this sort of innate curiosity 
that I already had as a kid and then that persisted um, as a teenager and then that also um, during university sort of drove me. And I have to say that um, in my early years, I didn't really reflect much upon whether things would be different for me as a woman versus I would have been a male. It was more just like, well, you know, I was lucky that I was raised to not think about that much. So, you know, from a parental standpoint, I sort of was always encouraged to just, um, hey, you, you should just do what you want to do and what you're passionate about. And, you know, that being female shouldn't sort of hinder me in any kind of way. And so I initially just kind of pursued my interest really. And I sort of took one step at a time. I don't think I had a large master plan how my career would pan out. And um, then, you know, I, I, I studied medicine um, in, in Germany and um, already along that path was sort of the first couple of times where I then began to realize that um, maybe things wouldn't be the same for me as a woman. I had this really huge interest in endocrinology all along. Um, that was just something that I, I was passionate thinking about, you know, how different organs communicate, how that actually affects our health and well-being. And um, I wanted to first apply that to actually reproductive endocrinology and thought about having a career in that branch um, of endocrine. And so, you know, I was um, at Heidelberg University and approached the um, chief of reproductive endocrine there just saying, you know, I want a research career in this um, area and how do I get started? What can I do? How can I get involved in research? And that was the first time somebody actually openly said to me that that path would not be for me because I am a woman. And, you know, that gave me pause and didn't deter me. But, you know, it's sort of these punches that you sort of take along your path where you go, mm -hmm. well, why should things be different for me you know I've done everything right to this point I'm I'm dedicated I'm getting the right grades I mean I'm doing all of that so um that um you know was a little punch it didn't sort of deter me um but then I um reflecting back I have to say that in Germany there were simply no kind of role models. So in some ways you couldn't look anywhere to say, well, that could be me or this could be the path, how I get there. It was more hearing, you know, that's not you. Um, and then I was very fortunate that um, I got the opportunity just as a medical student to um, go to UC San Francisco on a research exchange program. And um, really in San Francisco, things were um, a little different already, like this was 1991, than um, they were in Germany at the time. And um, reflecting back now, it made actually a huge difference that there I saw many women in science that actually worked for a female PI. Um, it, it wasn't obvious to me then that that made a difference, but sort of reflecting back now, I know that having sort of seen how well, people just, you know, they have lives. I mean, for one, I actually saw that there were women who, you know, they had, um, they also shaped their, their lives as they wanted them. So there wasn't sort mm -hmm. of this one path. I think in Germany, it was very much communicated. If you want to make it as a woman in science, then, you know, there's, there's almost like you, you have to completely adapt to that male world that shaped science and that it would be harder for you and and then you know it's almost like you you take the punches and you prevail right and and that was um not what i luckily found in san francisco so i think that sort of liberated me in a way to think about who i want to you know what kind of life do i want to have you know as a person mm -hmm. you know, our lives are more than just our um, or science work yes. as a scientist right I mean yeah. we want full lives and um, so I think that allowed me to, to think about how my how I can have a full life and pursue my interest and my goal to be a scientist and and there wasn't sort of just one way it seemed sort of like you you just experiment with it and that's okay thank you for sharing that I, I um I think I, I encountered a lot of similar sorts of themes, although, uh, you know, unlike unlike you, I didn't experience blatant uh, sexism. I wasn't ever told that I couldn't 
do something because I was a woman, but, you know, and I, I didn't, at least not that I perceived, you know, we all of course want to believe that the world is fair. That's what can, you know, part of what can blind us to some of these, these forces. Um, as an as an undergrad, though, I did have an experience, you know, wanting to change from pure science to uh, bioinformatics, so to a computational um, uh, sort of direction. And I met an extraordinary amount of resistance from all of the professors and, you know, uh, program heads and all of that, you know, obviously a very male dominated field. And, you know, come to think of it, pretty much all of them were men who were sort of pushing back and asking, like, do you th do you really think you can do this? Um, Fortunately, like you, I was also raised by parents who uh, taught me I could do anything, and it never occurred to me to question my abilities uh, to be able to pull it off. Um, so I just, you know, sort of kept going. Um, but, you know, I certainly wonder now whether that sort of resistance would have happened if I were, you know, male or or white or, or what have you. And I, I, I worry that that kind of attitude certainly did discourage um, a lot of other women or minorities in science. Um, and so that's, you know, that with hindsight, you know, you see a lot of these things and how um, how they they have changed the field as we go, even at such an early uh, sort of age. Um, I also studied in Heidelberg for, uh, for grad school, um, you know, noticed there too, and this is again, you know, kind of with the benefit of hindsight, there is a lot of entrenchment in these, cultural stereotypes and, uh, you know, uh, the inappropriate jokes that uh, kind of just feel part and parcel. And, you know, there was a bit of a, oh, you know, don't be, you know, so American and politically correct. Stereotypes are funny. They're partly true. Let's laugh at them. Let's uh, enjoy them. And, you know, certainly later with the benefit of hindsight, realizing how harmful some of those were, um, you know, to uh, especially specific groups of people. So it was only for me when I really reached the work workforce that I perceived the, the scale of the problem, um, especially when coming to NICIF and, you know, through this uh, initiative on women in science and engineering that I mentioned that, um, you know, we, we collected this huge data set, um, over 500 uh, institutions in, in uh, nearly 40 countries, and finding that, you know, on average, 25% of the full professors were female across the world. Um, and in a third of those institutions, it's more like 10%. Um, and you just see this, you know, really beautiful, really horrifying, you know, leaky uh, pipeline where, where women are lost at every step of that academic pipeline. And this was really shocking to me to, to see the scale of that, um, you know, and that, that, uh, that was sort of what, you know, led me to, to become an advocate as well. And, you know, then uh, Susan asked me to integrate some of this into, um, into my job, which, uh, you know, has been incredibly rewarding, even though it, it can be very difficult to focus on this and then see, you know, just how you perceive more of these things. And then it becomes a little bit more frustrating. There's, a, there's so much, you know, sort of work to do, but, you know, certainly working with people like Susan um, helped me to find ways to, uh, to, to persevere through all of this. And I, so my next question for you is, you know, are there some lessons that you, that you learned from um, gender minority role models that helped you to persevere as you were, as you were going through this? these punches. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I think what you, I mean, I think that that weren't sort of these, these, you know, I feel like that wasn't sort of active, um, maybe messages that were sent to me, but just observing um, women who achieve in different ways. And I think I was mm -hmm. fortunate to sort of see that, that I, you know, some women I worked with or that I experienced that climbed the ladder all the way up to, you know, be National Academy of Sciences members. And, you know, they had very, very prolific careers. Others who I worked with, um, you know, they um, maybe decided to, to focus on a certain field that is maybe not one of these very highly competitive fields. And they, everyone sort of shapes their, their lives differently. And yet, you know, you're, you're um, contributing to your field, you are successful. And it just seeing that, that you can make these different choices mm -hmm. and still you know, have significant contributions. I think we are also like taught that the only way 
to succeed, especially in science, because there's almost that this idea that unless you come up victorious as like, you know, the most prominent person in your field, it's almost like you're taught to have failed. That's also mm -hmm. like that, that message a little bit that we've been that shaped science and that and that's not true when you think about the scientific discovery landscape and when we think about how fields were shaped mm -hmm. and um, we review that now maybe 20 30 years later it's like well how did we gain this knowledge and you realize this wasn't just that one single person that we might associate with that field that there were actually many people contributing and maybe some of the not so um, well-known contributions actually had huge impact on a certain field. And to me, um, I think also seeing that, um, it, it almost like eased that pressure because I think as women, we, you know, we have more pressures going into that than males because we all know that science is um, a competitive field. And I think males and females sort of, um, you know, it's a little scary at times to think, well, am I going to climb to the top? But then as women, we have these extra obstacles. And then, you know, the, the one piece of research that actually I have to say has been uh, very revealing to me is the, is the one on, on stereotype threat. You know, when you're, when you're a person in a room and um, you belong to a minority and there's less than 20% of you, it's actually proven that it puts amazing stress on you so that means mm -hmm. you are you know we as women um going through this um we're essentially there's already that stress of the career we have that extra stress because most of the you know whether it's a scientific meeting any room you find yourself and there's only there's sometimes less than 20 percent of you and you know growing up in germany it was probably you know, not even five percent um and I didn't mm. know about that, but, but all that, um, I think what, to come back to your question and what made it possible, is actually sort of seeing that you don't have to um, think that there's only that, this is either you reach that top or there is no place for you. It was almost like thinking that you, you can find different places in science and make significant contributions. And I think this is also, where we at in academia right now, you know, we all know that a lot of people are not making that choice anymore. And maybe that culture that we have shaped now um, contributes to the fact that so many people decide that, you know, they feel it's maybe not the path they want to take to contribute to that. And, and to me, it's not like that these people are then necessarily people who have less ability to contribute. It's maybe just that. Um, they just don't want to do it in the framework of that system, mm -hmm. in the framework of that kind of competition. And maybe, you know, there is still a gender difference also how you socialize and how you're thinking about contributing. And mm -hmm. since this world in, of science is so dominated by um, certain, you know, maybe male metrics of how people compete and what success actually entails, that it doesn't resonate. And, you know, that might also contribute a lot to that leakiness of the pipeline. And I think that's the cultural work we have cut out now for us to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, your point about male metrics and kind of like a lot of these, you know, sort of male uh, styles of leading, one of the big kind of breakthroughs for me was learning from um, people like Susan and, uh, you know, a former mentor of mine, Liz Schwarzbach, that, you know, you could, you could actually lead with the people in mind rather than the results in mind. You could lead with joy. Mm -hmm. You can lead with empathy. You could lead with people's well-being at the forefront. And that was just, you know, not something I had seen as frequently in academic science, because like you say, it's all around these metrics of, you know, what are your papers? Are they at the top of the field? Are they the top impact factor? And this, this kind of, you know, minimizes a lot of the really important contributions and leadership qualities that it that it requires to keep scientific progress going. Um, I mean, I think a huge contributor to um, maybe to also women not advancing and why do we see that in the corporate world? I think the corporate world actually has changed their culture more rapidly than um, the academic world has. We, we have to face that, that that is true. Mm -hmm. And um, it's because in 
academia, you know, we are, it's, it's sort of a select few people selecting who are the next people who we're going to allow into the system, who we're going to promote in the system. And when you think about that, um, we also, again, when you go and you read the literature, we know it's human nature to gravitate towards people who are like us. So mm -hmm. now what we have in academia is, you know, we have shaped that culture. It's been shaped, you know, by males. We're having males selecting that next generation and, you know, would they select people based on? And, and again, you can't even blame anyone. It's human nature to select people who are exactly like you. And um, so that I think has contributed that within academia, we're, we haven't advanced as quickly as maybe um, other um, walks of life or even industries have, because we have this, this sort of funnel system that, right? We have these mm -hmm. select few people who make these decisions, who gets promoted, who gets to enter the system. You know, it's, everything is based on what somebody thinks of you, right? Because we, we base, essentially the next step is always contingent on first, what is your thesis advisor? think about you? <laughs> Does your postdoc <laughs> advisor think about you, right? And, and those mm -hmm. are relatively small networks of people where we have a certain metric of how we think about what success looks like. And then um, I think I would extend that even beyond, um, you know, women that I think has also kept academia um, very white, white male, and maybe also when you think about social mobility, right? We're not doing well um, that people who don't come from privileged backgrounds actually mm -hmm. have academic careers because we've sort of created this closed, you know, can almost say like a, a clubbish kind of um, uh, a promotion system where um, people always just look out for the next person who sort of acts and looks like them. And we've mm -hmm. even sometimes glorified that. I mean, we talk about lineages and families right we, we even yes. say that in science and so look this person comes from a lineage of science yes, this you know? great lineage <laughs> then they must be amazing too and you know we have to give it, them the promotion or the grant exactly the, yeah right or the or the paper yeah. without as or much this scrutiny. person will sure be successful because look at what the father has done or you know we you still hear that um even in this day that people all the time talk like that in science all the time yeah and, certainly uh, yeah. We hear and that I in our in our grant reviews and, you know, all of that sort of thing. And it's, you know, it's something we yeah. try to correct and say, well, isn't it a more interesting question to ask if the, the person has outperformed their environment rather than, you know, oh, look, they're from this lineage. They're, uh, they're obviously great, you know, even if the proposal exactly. is lacking something. Um, yeah, certainly. And then think about job interviews, right? We, we go for these dinners and then we go with like three, four senior faculty and then, you mm -hmm. know... What do you have to contribute to the dinner conversation, right? It's, again, is it that academics maybe then like to talk about certain things? And what if that was not part of your experience growing up? Then you might fall short on what you actually have to say at that dinner table. And then, you know, the people who are... Um, in a position to recruit you might say, you know, I don't know how engaging was that person really, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. So there are a lot of these kinds of structures in academia, mm -hmm. in scientific research that have kind of exacerbated these biases. I'm, I'm reminded of a quote from uh, Ruth Hubbard um, from 1990, but I think it still holds true today that so long as biology as an enterprise is almost exclusively a male occupation, it will be a biased science masquerading as objective. And that is certainly true of, you know, being exclusively white, exclusively, you know, able, exclusively uh, socioeconomically privileged. Um, and, you know, in the interests of science, it is uh, to our interest to bring in more diversity because we know that that fuels innovation. But, you know, certainly that's a uh, <clears throat> easier said than done. Um, I, I wanted to talk as well. One one phenomenon I think that's that's kind of been made it difficult uh, for, especially difficult for women in science is is that we're socialized as women to compete with one another um, rather than to support one another. Can you talk about that? Your impressions of that and how we might be able to 
change that? I think it is changing. I think that's the good news that yeah. um, I really, um, compared to um, when I entered science sort of like, you know, 25-ish years ago, um, there were very, very few women. And um, I personally really had, you know, there were not supporters, right? So even in Germany, I came across like a few women who were already like giants in science and, you know, you sort of looked at them and you were hoping that you could glean some insight for, you know, what is it like or what does it take? And if anything, there was more, um, you know, no, they wanted to exclude other women and they were not open to have these conversations and that really um, was not part of the fabric. And, um, and it's probably because it was just incredibly hard to even to make that, um, make it to that point. And I, I don't know the psychological literature on that, but maybe there is even, you know, can even be explained if you have to prevail as sort of one of the select few who has to sort of survive in, in that environment or prevail or make it, then maybe that is just a mechanism that your brain uses. You see it as a zero sum um, game, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. But I do think that um, it is really changing and it has already changed. I mean, we're now getting to this point where women are building networks and, you know, we should do more of it to also build support networks. I mean, I myself um, have found that that just over the last couple of years, there's been far more conversations around that. I can say that, um, you know, even I'm in the diabetes field. Um, we actually got together and, and formed a network to also then think about, you know, how can we actually give um, women who are entering the diabetes field now more of a voice and or be the voice as now more senior women um, mm -hmm. in the field so that, you know, they don't get overlooked um, when it comes to awards or um, opportunities for promotion. So we networked with each other to say, you know, let's be a little strategic to make sure that that next generation actually gets more um, support also from peers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of it is also this sort of competitive nature that we feel like we need to have, which is that, you know, we need to be sort of fighting and fighting rather than helping and, you know, em emulating those male characteristics of success rather than perhaps mm -hmm. what, what we might, um, you know, uh, call female qualities of success. Um, okay, so I want to talk a bit more about now the progress that we've made in recent years and some of these big sort of watershed moments that have that have driven that progress to see what lessons that we might be able to take from them now as we sort of continue moving forward. Um, so there were you know, less than 20 years ago, maybe on the order of 15 years ago, there was a narrative running around that, yes, okay, there's less women in science, but that's actually because women are inferior as scientists. They're biologically, you know, their brains aren't quite uh, uh, as attuned to STEM fields as uh, as men's, and therefore they're not interested, they're not successful. Um, you know, we had some pretty prominent uh, voices um, e echoing this narrative, Harvard, you know, president, uh, Nobel laureates, uh, psychologists, um, of course, for every remark like this, another woman becomes an advocate. So this is one good side effect of that. But, you know, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, those, th that narrative and the efforts since that have, have been made to debunk that. We're not really having that conversation as much anymore. There might be some people out there who still believe this, but um, what, it, what, in your view, helped to change uh, that narrative? I mean, we still hear it, right? <laughs> and and we, sure. we get outraged, um, rightfully so, when we hear it. Um, but, you yeah. know, I, I remember even like, uh, I think like last year, there was like one other comment that, um, you know, went public. So it's, it's not um, that, that we've that, that we're, we've got transcended beyond it. But um, I think the, the Me Too movement um, that really started, um, you know, not out of science, um, but that really, I think, um, put it at the forefront. I think that has been an incredible accelerator of our self-awareness of like really thinking about the structures. Before that, you know, when I think about 
maybe five or even 10 years ago, it was always just this like, let's just think about how we recruit more women. And then if we recruit them, um, that will sort of suffice. And then the, the, essentially it will sort of self-correct. And then maybe in 50 years, you know, we have reached equality. And, and I do think that with the Me Too movement, um, came more discussion about these inherent structures and the power structures and what these power structures actually do to people. Um, and with that, we've really started to talk more about our institutional cultures and the fabric of our institutions and what needs to change so people can actually succeed within these institutions who come from different walks of life. And that, um, that I think has really spurred our sort of thinking about what does diversity and living diversity actually mean. And what I've seen in the US, um, you know, and I only recently moved to Germany, so I only like three, four months ago. So uh, most of my experience is um, from the US, but you know, I've been at the University of California for decades and, and just in the last five years, I've really witnessed how we're changing our hiring practices, how mm -hmm. a lot of things really started to change and, and, and really massively, I think, sort of going along with the Me Too movement and, and that, that debate just being at the forefront of society. Yeah, absolutely. That was, you know, that was one of those really incredible movements that, you know, didn't fade in the next news cycle that really garnered that sustained attention that we we needed to make change to call attention to these toxic environments that um, that women are being put in and uh, many people are being put in um, <clears throat> as well. I also uh, want to shout out, you know, um, some of the work by Ben Barris and other uh, other advocates in terms of just helping to debunk uh, some of these stereotypes about, you know, women not having the right brains for science and that sort of thing. I think um, my colleague shared a uh, a piece that he published in Nature um, in, I believe, 2006 or so uh, around, you know, just debunking all of this neurological, psychological research that helped us to, you know, at least denormalize that narrative, to take it out of the, the, the kind of mainstream, which is really where it was sitting at that time. Um, and now we don't have to question things like, okay, yeah, we should have a gender diverse hiring committee. We should have a gender diverse um, review committee. We should have a gender diverse speaker lineup. Um, these are a bit more taken for granted now, but there was a fight that helped us to get there. And I think, you know, uh, one of the lessons for me at least was just, you know, that, that power of that vocal advocacy um, that, you know, he and so many others uh, really boldly stood up and, uh, and, and and sort of fought for. Um, in the Me Too movement, I, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, especially in academia that we see, and this has to do with the power structures you were talking about, where really this, um, you know, you have the sort of the PIs as God, um, you know, they're, the tenure uh, makes makes so many of them untouchable. Um, some people use this for good, like uh, like Ben, um, and some people use it use it for bad to to kind of normalize some of these. I, at least I observed in academia a really a really deeply casual attitude towards sexualized commentary, um, mm -hmm. towards uh, harassment, um, towards you know PIs dating their students, PIs dating their postdocs, and uh, or, you know or not dating, but, you know, any, any other sort of interactions and not to say that this is completely gone. You know, we certainly hear about cases like this now, but I, I think it did help to, um, to dislodge some of those things from being as common as they are. I, I feel like there is still work to go and I, I would welcome your comment on, you know, what we, what we can carry forward from that as we continue to disrupt those sort of normal behaviors um, in academia and research. And we really have to call them out, right? When we observe them, I think we we sort of we all have to be advocates. And um, and one thing that that I think I'm also now seeing as as a leader of an institution is we cannot underestimate sort of the fear that actually people have to speak out. And I think that came also out in 
the Me Too movement. You know, there was this movie mm -hmm. she said that actually sort of um, really um, detailed the you know, the beginnings of it. And, and what really struck me is um, also how these women were so fearful to speak out because, you know, everyone fears repercussion. You say, well, you know, you say we have a safe space now, but what if then there is somebody else who's powerful and now I spoke out and now I'm being labeled branded a certain way and I still then you know for my next job or whatever I want to do in my career next that might be held against me I think these mm -hmm. fears are are still real and they're there and and that will take a lot of effort and 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 you know all of us essentially to for people to really feel safe um speaking out and calling it out because I don't think we're, we're near there yet, you know, as you said, there's been some of these very, um, it's almost like the tip of the iceberg cases, you know, where we've seen all of a sudden, well, institution mm -hmm. acted and there seems to be hope for change, but we all know that occurs, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg, we know there's the big iceberg underneath. Um, and that iceberg goes to the day-to-day -day interactions, you know, what people say to each other and um, how people interact with each other. And, and, you know, then you go, well, can I actually call this out? Can, you know, where does it start? What can you call out? Mm -hmm. And I do think that, um, especially like as institutional leaders, we have an obligation to, to have, to actually articulate that, say, you know, yes, you know, we can call these things out and we should call these things out. Absolutely. And to be receptive to these things yeah. being called out when they are, I think uh, there's certainly a lot of apprehension when, you know, um, perhaps more junior people in the pipeline witness these things, they exactly. hesitate maybe to, to see how it could be received um, if they were to bring it up to their leadership. And and I think, you know, the role of leaders is really to signal that they are open to that, that feedback and they are open to finding ways to, uh, to change and create those, those sort of better, um, better environments. Some of the other, you know, sort of big, big uh, events in, in recent years have, of course, been the pandemic, undoubtedly um, something that was really detrimental for, for gender equity, caused a lot of women to leave the field. Um, placed, you know, a really undue burden on caregivers and parents. Um, you know, I, I think that we can take some lessons on how we should be supporting people in these roles better as a field, especially in science. I think, you know, we didn't really do a great job um, supporting uh, supporting people in these positions. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I I I, I do agree that um, we. You know, I mean that that will always be a challenge, right? How, given that women often are the care, the, the prime caregivers. So then, you know, something like during the pandemic um, falls apart, like our system of daycare. You know, that women um, that are especially important for women, so that they can have careers and be successful. And then, if one piece of that. Um, puzzle or you know that 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 was created um or, or this this the infrastructure that was that that is there for to support women um is taken away we've sort of seen how it has really impacted women more so than men during the pandemic and um i liked um you know how the new york stem cell foundation has this um you know the one measure that you say well if, if you're actually supporting women with um, if they want to go to um, conferences, these, these measures that you actually give them resources for daycare. So you you also help out with, um, you know, giving especially women the support so that they mm -hmm. have um, the, the necessary help and freedom to also, you know, pursue their professional goals. And I think that whenever we don't have that infrastructure is it it hits women harder than men we have to face that that is still a fact absolutely and that, that you were referring to one of the seven actionable strategies that was published by um by our initiative on women in science and engineering i think uh, my colleague can share that in the chat as well and we'll definitely come back to those but i think one positive thing that came out of the pandemic undeniably 
was the Black Lives Matter movement. While that, um, you know, was uh, was triggered by an incredibly tragic event of uh, of George Floyd's murder, um, it certainly brought everything to a boiling point. It captured the world's attention within that context and really led to some of the sustained action and mobilization of groups of organizations um, of saying, you know, we're we're fed up with this. We can't we can't take this anymore. This has been going on for far too long. And it, you know, thankfully was not one of those things that just faded away. And I think we're still, you know, riding the wave of that racial reckoning today as we look at power structures in, in every field, um, but also in academic science. I think what I mean, uh, the what Black Lives Matter really did is it also then turned the focus on you know, as you said, it, it called out the power structures. And, and that's where I think there is also a parallel to the Me Too movement, um, because in the end, it's all about our societal power structures. But then also, um, I think it put at the forefront also more than how racial minorities um, are discriminated against and how it's also for them uh, much harder to enter, you know, like white male dominated fields like science so i what i really um took as a positive from all of that is that it it now even broadened our discussion right it's not just yes. about women in science it's actually all connected right i think now we all understand that all these things are interconnected and that we almost can't think about them in isolation because right. it is ultimately like the structures we're in that keep everyone else out. And, and I think that these separate conversations we've had as a society on like the Me Too and then Black Lives Matter is sort of brought it together that we now, we tend to think about it more holistically. And I think that's the right way to think. And I think that's also where institutions now develop policies and are thinking about this more holistically and and that I think is in a way a good thing that came out of all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think that just 15 years ago, you know, again to go back to that narrative of women are, you know, their brains don't work for science. We've come a very long way to say that, you know, at, at that time people didn't even really want to hear about women in science. I felt like if I raised something like that, people would say, oh, you're, you know, you're just whining, you know, at least now we can talk about this. Now we have words for this. Now we can talk about um, racial minorities in science and what they experience. Mm -hmm. I never even felt comfortable, I, you know, talking about being a woman of color in science. I thought, you know, those are words I never said until the um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And so I think it's it's given enormous voice to a lot of these challenges that have been faced and that we just didn't know how to talk about. I think that the fact that you and I are sitting here today is actually a, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> is actually a product of all of that, right? It's really That's um, right. a reckoning of society and that we, you know, if I think about it early in my life, I, I have um, reflected upon it. I think I started, you know, as I said, sort of very early, I maybe didn't even reflect on it that being a woman would make it, that anything would be different. Um, and then you sort of like took these punches and you go like, whoa, something is different now. Mm -hmm. And then you thought about it, but you actually didn't talk much about it. And I feel even for me to like be sitting here with you today, I might have not done that 10 years ago because nobody did. Yeah. We were right. just not there yet as society to say, well, you know, it's important to articulate it. And, and you know, even though we haven't found, you know, we haven't really like arrived, it's still that um, the conversation is the first step and then really keeping it at the forefront of people's conscience, I think is the important thing. And that, you know, absolutely. And that leads to, you know, something I wanted to talk about as we as we think about, you know, now starting to look forward, the role of leadership. Now you as as the leader of a new institute, um, or not, as the new leader of an institute, I should say, um, how do you see your responsibility now in that role? And how should leaders of institutes be thinking about their responsibility um, when it comes to these issues? Yeah, no, I mean, I think we have a huge responsibility as leaders to um, really um, 
you know, to, to, to keep the issue at the forefront of the debate and um, to really think about how we, um, you know, we all have sort of policies now on, differ, on diversity, equity, inclusion, but I think the key is how do we actually live them, right? What do we mm -hmm. do as institutional leaders to make sure we're making um, progress? Because having a policy somewhere on your website or, you know, or a statement, somewhere yeah. doesn't, right. doesn't change how you do things. So paying lip um, service is very I, easy. Yeah. Yes. And um, I personally think that, that it's really important that we now are not just think about, well, how many um, women or minorities um, do we actually hire in our organizations? So it's just like, not just about like meeting the quota and then, thinking that then, you know, it will automatically correct itself. And then in like 30 years, we will have arrived. Um, but realizing that um, when you actually hire a minority or a woman, then that's where the work kind of starts. You really mm -hmm. have to um, think about sponsorship. You know, we're like transcended from just mentorship to also sponsorship. And um, we know also from the literature that, again, coming back to that, we tend to gravitate towards people and promoting people who are like us, that we have to have institutional um, measures and mechanisms that we sort of counteract these biases, right? Because all our faculty, senior faculty, essentially have an obligation then to also um, play an active role in making mm -hmm. these new hires succeed, right? And That's with right. that comes, you know, thinking about, is there a conference that they might know in their field? And then thinking, well, you know, there is, there's a newly hired female, let me think about really suggesting that person for that conference. You know, anything to sort of network um, people to put them up for, awards to um, go the extra mile, nominating people. And uh, we as institutional leaders have to make sure that there's mechanisms in place that these biases don't just play out, right? That it's mm -hmm. not like, because if we don't do anything proactive, um, you know, the people are biased, even, you know, we as women are right. also biased, right? We all Absolutely. know that from research that it's yeah. not just like um, males being biased against women. We are, we have the same biases. Um, so really the, the, um, what we need to do and um, the task at hand now is to think about measures that keep our biases in check and keep us in check and accountable. And um, and I think there's many things we can do. You know, one, what I mentioned is the act of sponsorship um, of women and, you know, really making that an institutional goal and enlisting all our faculty to um, help fulfill that. Um, and another thing is then um, the whole self-awareness training, right? We, we all know that we have biases. So then how do we help people overcome essentially not that they act upon these biases um and and we all know that you know self-awareness training is is a huge component in that and mm -hmm. one thing that is just still not widely spread in academia and even less so i'm noticing here in Germany than um, what I experienced in the US is to actually help people with like leadership training with certain specific, you know, tools and measures that we can all um, help ourselves overcome our biases. So we need tools, we need help. I don't think you can just, you know, task people to say, don't act upon your biases. We will, <laughs> right? So, right, <laughs> right. it's will, also... Um, yeah, so as institutions, we need to really um, help every member of our organization to, you know, be that advocate that they need to be. And with that, you know, you, you have to provide certain training, self-awareness training and um, do 360s and, you know, do all of these mm -hmm. things so that we can really like see how our actions affect others. 
I think the self-awareness is a really great point. And, uh, you know, there was a, a really great quote by, um, by Shankar Vedantam in, in, in this, uh, this book a, a couple of decades ago already, but around unconscious bias, those who travel with the current will always feel that they are good swimmers, whereas those who swim against the current may never realize that they are better swimmers than they imagine. And that's, you know, such a huge part of the awareness training that that all of us, you know, really need to engage in. I was really struck, though, I want to go back to your, your role as a leader that, you know, when you told me that the first remarks that you gave to your colleagues at, uh, at Max Delbruck Center were around culture change, what did you say and what do you think that leaders need to be doing to enact those culture changes that that will uh, advance these values? Yeah, no, so I um, I mean, what I said was just really broad that, you know, if we if we really want an institution an organization where we can sort of allow everyone to bring their talent to bear for scientific discovery for advancing our mission, you know, I'm convinced and, and research has actually shown that, that only if we create a culture that enables that, we're going to be the best we can be, right? Mm -hmm. That um, everyone's potential should um, really come to bear for the, you know, for, for the scientific discovery. And we all bring different aspects to that. So we need to create an organizational culture where people feel, um, you know, that they can speak their mind, that they actually, that their creativity is appreciated, that um, they feel sort of liberated, right? Open mm -hmm. and free. And to me, this was a huge difference when I um, first went to the US, um, which was now, you know, more than 30 years ago, but Germany tended to be hierarchical in that um, you were only like, you know, essentially only senior people spoke. And then if you were more junior, you you sort of didn't speak. And um, to me, coming to the US, I actually saw that that was culturally already different there, where, you know, even like being a medical student, I was asked to comment on <laughs> certain things. And, um, and I think that open culture and really um, creating a form of communication throughout the entire organization that, um, you know, every every person's word counts, and you know, every every person's contribution is valued. Mm -hmm. And that is really important because only then will people really um, be able to develop, to learn, to be the best they could possibly be. And 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 that to me is the big organizational challenge, and to you know shape the culture or improve the culture to move more towards that ideal that really literally every person in the organization in the institution feels that no you know i i'm appreciated i know that my contributions are valued and that you know i i'm also heard that's that's so important um you know some of the ways that we've been thinking about it here has have also been in tying you know funding to it since we're a grant making organization We've now incorporated additional elements in our application around, um, you know, understanding the roads traveled by by a candidate, understanding how their identity may have impacted their trajectory, and using that as part of the story of success, um, and valuing, you know, commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. This is something we've really embedded into the structure of our review process, and it's been really well received um, by our reviewers. I have to give a lot of credit to them. Um, but this also helps to build a community where that culture mm -hmm. is actually the case, where we are, you know, uh, advancing these values. So suppose that we find a way to, you know, actually move forward and resolve some of these, these key issues. What will an institute or a community that really enjoys this culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging be like? And how will it be different um, than what we have now? Yeah, I mean, to me, actually, the, the scientific discovery and that cultural change are intertwined in that we know that scientific discovery now really takes far more collaboration. It takes these interdisciplinary teams. So we really are moving to, from this sort of like single lab, single investigator 
towards this more networked enterprise of science. And that's where the opportunities for discovery and innovation are, it's sort of at the intersection of different teams where mm -hmm. people work in sort of a matrix and in networks together. And in order to make that work, and um, we really need that cultural change because we need team members fulfill different roles. And it can no longer be that sort of one person then sort of owns all the, the rewards or even says, right. you know, I own this piece of discovery, right? Because it's no longer like that. It mm -hmm. would, you take one piece out and the whole thing would crumble away and um, there would be no discovery pipeline. So I think that change in value system in and academia reward structures. and especially yeah. in science, we, we really, it's all sort of interconnected to me, the culture change, the way we do science, and then, you know, how do we actually make discoveries in the future? And, and, and then, you know, what are our, um, what are, what is our reward system? Yeah. How do we even measure scientific success? Right. I think we have to have all these discussions and, and they are happening. And actually the, um, in Europe, I've, I've seen that there are um, plenty of these discussions and, um, and there's even like conferences, there's an institution called EU Life, um, that is an organization um, of mm -hmm. different um, non-university science institutes, and they're holding a conference to actually discuss these issues. And I think that's, um, that's a really good that's step great. forward to sort of um, have these discussions and really think about, well, what, what would an academic um, biomedical innovation center look like in 10 years time, right? I, I love that. And I, I have to say, you know, we're we're also seeing a lot of other funders in our community, you know, uh, change the way that they're evaluating uh, grant proposals and with, with similar values in mind. Um, you know, another way to look at it is, as well as the individual experience. What is the experience of an individual when they can be in that mm -hmm. sort of a community? And I, you know, I want to go back to, uh, to, to Ben Barris. I think he's, you know, he just nailed so many of these perspectives so well. And also, I don't want to talk about gender equity without talking about the transgender experience. He he noted, you know, growing up transgender in a time of universal ignorance and hate has been difficult and emotionally painful. I believe that most or all of this pain is preventable in a future world where people are more supportive and more understanding. So imagine what somebody can achieve, what a brilliant scientist can achieve when you take those barriers away, when you take that that pain and that shame and that exclusion and, and these other systematic equalities that the LGBTQIA uh, community experiences, um, you know, so regularly, and there's a, a paper that we can share about this. If you take away all of that mental anguish, um, imagine what people are capable of achieving and, you know, integrating into the community. My goodness, this has flown by. I want to make sure that we do. I could talk to you all day, but we we unfortunately don't have time for that. So I want to close by talking about some actions um, that, you know, anything that we haven't touched on already that we can recommend to our audience today. Many questions came in around this. For example, what DEI uh, committees can take to have an impact. Um, what? How can we all do our part? What? What? What do you want people to take home today? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do think that what we want people to take home is that, you know, we are all every day we come to work, right? We all have to be that change advocate, right? So to me that um, the institution can do things like, uh, you know, make sure that, that there's um, fair frameworks, hiring practices, that there's a support system, you know, if you actually experience um, being marginalized that, you know, there's a safe space and you can speak up and institution will support you. But then the culture change is actually up on, on each individual coming mm -hmm. to work every day. And, and I think that, um, and we as institutional leaders can enable it, amplify it. Um, um, but it has to be, it can't be purely like, you know, we live from the top. It also has to be lived from the bottom up. It ultimately all has to come together. Yeah, very, very, very well said. I, I think, 
you know, in terms of DEI committees, um, those are those are some great points. Advocating for these policies that can really make a change, to advocating for changes in the way that reward structures, um, you know, operate in our in our system, when the way that decision making committees are uh, operate, the way that um, you know these kinds of uh, values of what um, what is progress, what what actually is an achievement, and making sure that we're rewarding that in the most inclusive way possible. These are some of the things that I think of with with committees. I think in terms of leaders, you know, uh, it's it's the responsibility, and we try to do this as much as we can, is to take take a close look at these issues, understand exactly what they are, spotlight these issues um, as we do with you know events like this, engage discussions from those, you know, the people who are experiencing uh, these issues and devise actionable strategies um, and, you know, things that everybody can do and, and, and uh, you know, communicating those as well as possible. And I, I will also just say that none of this can be done alone. We're all, you know, we're all trying to do it. And it's, it's so imperative that we work together across institutions to, to come up with these strategies and implement them together and share our learnings and, and, uh, it, you know, and I, we're happy to be part of a, an organization called the Health Research Alliance, um, an alliance of nonprofit funders that does this on a, on a regular basis as well, you know, just sharing what those best practices are, what those what those learnings are. And so, um, you know, th those are those are some of some of the things that we can do. And, you know, I say for the individuals calling out intolerance in any way that your position allows you to, you know, sometimes that looks like telling another trusted colleague, sometimes that looks like going to the top, sometimes that looks like social media. Um, but, you know, the best thing is where you can come with solutions, with actions, with remedies, everybody can complain about everything, but coming up with like, okay, what can we do about this? How do we make sure this never happens again? That's something that we need everybody's brain um, really working on. So, Oh my goodness. Thank you, Mike, so much for this. Um, it's been a real honor and a privilege uh, to hear from you. I think our field is becoming more equitable every day uh, because of leaders like you. So I thank you so much for your, your dedication and your, and your passion here. I thank you all for joining us today. Um, just by showing up, you're already making a great difference. You're staying in the conversation. You're staying, you know, um, coming up with ideas and part of this dialogue, please reach out, you know, um, help us spread awareness about the impact that all of us can make by sharing your impressions, um, you know, about this. Use social media, circulate our YouTube recording, which you'll you'll all receive very soon. Um, you know, we, we really want this to be a team community effort. So we hope to see you all at a future NICEF event. We've actually got one coming up uh, in a couple of weeks that we're doing in partnership with ISSCR around, um, around uh, DEI initiatives and, um, you know, the learnings from uh, from people who have run some of those. So please, uh, please do join us if you can for that. Um, and until then, uh, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And thank you so much.